I'm Ellen Mary. And I'm Michael Perry. And he's a plant geek. And she's a plant addict. And And this this is is the the Plant Plant Based Podcast. Podcast. (laughs) This is more than just a gardening podcast. We'll be exploring the world of plants from every possible angle. We'll be talking about plant-based diets, plant materials and fabrics, the well-being qualities of plants, and giving plenty of gardening tips and tricks. So we'll be chatting worldwide to companies and individuals that are being creative with plants in new and exciting ways. From fabulous flower crowns to foliage filled lounges, botanical moisturizers to bamboo clothing. It's all here. And it's all made of plants. Sutton's suppliers of gardening products since 1806 sponsor the Plant Based Podcast. Visit them online at suttons.co.uk. I feel very at home today, sitting in a polytunnel full of plants, and um, Hannah Claxton from Eve's Hill Veg Co., which is where we are. Hi, Hannah. There's also a baby <laughs> behind us, <laughs> baby Gloria, yeah. who's currently sleeping. She's currently asleep. But if you hear any noise, then, you know, you, it's, it's, it's the baby. <laughs> she may join in shortly. It's, it's not the plants crying. Um, and we're actually in a makeshift studio of sorts because trying to record in a polytunnel meant the sound was um, a bit off. So Hannah has very expertly um, surrounded us by uh, trays and sedums <laughs> in order to keep the sound in. <laughs> You'll definitely need a photo of this, though. It's probably our most yes. unusual podcast setup. It yet. is, but I'm really... <laughs> Really quite enjoying it. It's also very intimate. We're all very close. <laughs> but anyway, so Eve's Hill Veg Co. Thanks for having us today, Hannah. Pleasure. Thank you for coming. Um, I've been here before, of course. Um, we I showed no fear gardening around, so I know a little bit about the the, the place. But tell our listeners all about it. Mm. Okay, so we are a two-acre market garden. Garden. Um, we are on rented farmland in North Norfolk. We grow vegetables, which we sell locally to restaurants, and we have a veg bag scheme. People come and collect their produce from us. Um, But we also have an ethos which is around enabling people to have access to a land-based project and skills, and we try and open up the site for people to come. So we run a volunteer programme on a Wednesday, and we have people come and learn and we have open days for the public to come and get involved, bring their kids, see what we're doing, see the techniques that we're using. And we're trying to just share our space with others. But you, you're very much about community here, aren't you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we, we want to create a project where people can feel a bit more connected to where their food comes from and, um, and understand that there are ecological techniques that can be used to grow food mm-hmm. um, and techniques that can... Um, increase the kind of productivity from your home garden scale to being able to go beyond this idea of self-sufficiency and to more the idea of feeding your local community so that's what we're really interested in we're not about self-sufficiency we're about yes sharing skills that you can take home and use in your garden or your allotment but that you can also use to be more productive and mm-hmm. share food and produce with others yeah that's not it's nice and it's it's important and going forward over the years it, it could be essential yeah well we think we think it is and we it's think now. yeah we think it is now we think you know i don't i wouldn't i wouldn't say so i'm part of a kind of wider movement of um kind of new generation and some older generation growers who are kind of going beyond where the kind of organic farming movement went to say we want food that's grown ecologically we want people to grow that food to work in safe and fairly paid environments Mm -hmm. we want to be able to pass those skills to others and we want those skills to develop and move forward um and this kind of movement in the uk at the moment is um kind of under the umbrella of land workers alliance yeah and Land Workers Alliance is about not just sharing those skills with others and with each other to, to build a, a, a stronger network of farmers and growers and producers, but also kind of lobbying mm. the government to mm. say, what are you doing about food production in this country? What are you doing about ecology in farming in this country? What are you doing about research? 
What are you doing about getting new, younger entrants into food production? What are you doing about training people in mm. horticulture, um, in productive horticulture? And, and actually making it our business to ask these questions about who is going to grow our food in the future? How is it going to be grown? And so we, we very much see this project as part of that wider... Part of that wider kind of sphere of yeah. growing, growing food. You're effectively offering the only market gardening course as well in the UK, is that right? Not in the UK, no. Uh -huh. <laughs> in Norfolk. But pretty so unique, right, if, what you're offering here as a course? If you wanted to study market gardening in the, uh -huh. in, in the UK, there isn't really a college or a university you can mm -hmm. go to to learn that. There okay. are brilliant places like Organic Lee Community Growers in London that run a level two city and guilds horticulture, which is tailored mm -hmm. to learn the skills of market gardening. There are brilliant projects, mostly in the West Country, where if you're willing to quit your life and your job and your family, that you can go and live there for a year. I mean, a bit like I did. I went mm -hmm. and worked for a year and did an apprenticeship on a, a farm in Herefordshire in order okay. to learn my wow. trade. There are ways of learning those skills. But what we're trying to do here with our traineeship, which is a, 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 a voluntary, uh, what we call a, a, a work education exchange, um, and with our apprenticeship, which is a paid position, is to offer people the opportunity to see a whole growing season, live in their homes, live in their communities, and learn hands-on um, about productive market gardening. And we really invest in the kind of training side of that. Like, we, mm -hmm. we, we don't want to see volunteering as something that is like, oh, great, people just come and barrow for us for free. Mm -hmm. it's, that's not what we're interested in at all. No. We're interested in having more people do the work we're doing and more people who are skilled up to be able to do the kind of work we're it's doing. It's so important. It's a fantastic project. You've but been going for three, yeah. three years, we, did you say? Yeah, two and a half years. We've done three growing seasons. And, I mean, for example, when we started our apprenticeship, which is a paid apprenticeship, we met with um, somebody who ran, ran horticulture apprenticeships in East Anglia who was able to tell us that there are only six horticulture apprenticeships in East Anglia currently, yes. uh, of which none of them are in productive horticulture. And that includes farm-scale food growing, no. not just <coughs> kind of market gardening or mm -hmm. walled, walled, market, walled mm. food gardening in, yeah. you know, beautiful yeah. stately homes. They're, the government pulled the plug on the apprenticeship for productive horticulture. Bad government. Which is kind of saying we don't want... Political we don't want food growers and obviously there's the garden scale and there's the farm scale but either way we've got a government that are saying mm. we, we don't want to invest in the training yeah. of the next how generation will, how will we feed everybody you know we have a growing population and there's loads of stats by you know 2050 there's some you know record yeah. number of people on the planet how are we going to feed them if people don't understand or are able yeah. to grow food well, my understanding of where the government sits on this, and I'm not an expert, and I can yeah. hook you in with amazing people at Landmarkers mm -hmm. Alliance who are doing such amazing work on this, but my understanding is that the government, in a free market economy, believes that the market will look after us and that food will just come from further afield. And in order to make food from further afield cheaper, we're talking about importing foods that probably has very little or no regulation around the food growing techniques, the use of dangerous chemicals and pesticides, uh, labour conditions. Um, so along with the kind of pushing out our pollution and pushing out our kind of um, ecological injustice, you're also pushing out the social injustices to let another country deal with it and let another mm -hmm. government maybe not deal with it yeah. and so that we can have cheaper food flown in and our government doesn't have to worry about whether we're producing food or not in this country and that's certainly more and more becoming the kind of the yeah. the policy and as we move towards brexit that seems to be the policy that the government um are going are moving towards so which is you know not just question. which is you know not just sad for people like me that are passionate about yeah. mm -hmm. about growing food and farm scale horticulturalists who are passionate about growing food but it's also sad for us because it means we're losing the contact with what, what we're eating and where mm. it's coming from and the impact that that, yeah. that, that is that, having it's just um brought up a question in my mind and that's um there's a lot going on about you know um trying to encourage people to eat more plants as part of their yes. diet um, and maybe not meat or not as much meat 
mm. if, if any, because obviously farming or agricultural animal farming is a huge problem with climate conditions, climate change and that kind of thing. And as a vegan, I'm always reading and promoting the fact that if, if you eat less meat, if you think about the population going forward, then we will need more plants. We will need more crops for people's diets. But how, how does that work if there's not enough people to grow grow the crops or understand it? I or think how it's does a that... really important question in the vegan movement. Yeah. I think uh, I had a group from the UEA come out here last year, international development students, and there was a few of them that were vegan campaigners and the conversation got onto, onto the politics of vegan food. And I just quite simply was saying to them, if you want to reduce the impact of your diet on the planet, you need to think about you, the, the climate that you live in, the soil that you live on, mm -hmm. and the food that's available to you from your surrounding area. Yeah. Otherwise, you are just impacting on the climate by flying in yeah. your avocados, yeah. Yeah. Your, Absolutely. your coconut Absolutely. milk, Couldn't agree your quinoa. More. And I'm not saying we shouldn't yeah. be eating those things. I love an avocado. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not righteous in that way, but I'm saying in terms of building a rural economy, mm. Mm. Yeah. we live in Norfolk, yeah. it's a beautiful rural um, farmland, and yet you ask anybody in any village in Norfolk, you know, what that land over there is used for, where that food ends up, mm -hmm. there's such a disconnect. And yet yeah, we could be right. having yeah. jobs and a thriving rural economy based on land-based... Yeah, land-based work. Work. Yeah, T I couldn't... Whether, agree whether that's point. growing grapes to make wine yeah. or hops to make beer or <laughs> vegetables to to you know eat in your kitchen and you know economically it has just got harder and harder and harder and harder in this country to farm mm. and grow food and there is every reason for every farmer and food grower to just give up and say i can't do it anymore mm. when you mm. know 30 40 years ago you could i i would be able to go to a bank and get a mortgage on a farm yeah. And I would be able to become a farmer if yeah. I wanted to, and based now, on that's... based on a conversation with a bank manager. Yeah, wow. and, and now times have changed very much. <laughs> there is no economic sum yeah. that mm -hmm. would allow me, as a farmer or a food producer, to get a mortgage and buy land or buy. You are clearly very passionate and yeah. knowledgeable. Mm. But where did it all begin for you in the first place? Um, <laughs> I had a very different life working in the music industry, and mm. when I quit that, I hence our sound box. Yes, were you a pop star? <laughs> I wasn't a pop star. I wasn't a sound engineer. Right? <laughs> um, and when I quit that, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I just needed uh -huh. a bit of space. I needed yeah. space in every sense, and I was really, I think, climate change and environmental mm -hmm. degradation was a really big question, and I didn't know anything about it, and I was like, how? do I engage with this massive mm -hmm. question? So we're looking at it desk. almost as an antidote to the life that yeah. you were having then, perhaps. And so I started volunteering at uh -huh. Market Garden, thinking, well, whatever happens, this will be a skill that, you know, hopefully one day I'll have a garden or an allotment and I can grow some veg for myself. I'll never, I'll mm. never regret having mm. that skill. Yeah. And it gradually it just took hold mm. with the, mm. the quiet and the nature and the plants uh -huh. and the colours and the insects. I mean, I had a love affair with cabbage white butterflies and I didn't know what they were. And obviously for anyone who grows cabbages, <laughs> yeah. you it's know... It's not that so much fun. It's not so much fun. <laughs> but when you first walk into a garden and it's just buzzing with insects mm. and bees and butterflies and life and energy... Um, you know, I, I definitely just fell in, I just fell in love. It's that connection, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's that connection that we have of nature that we've spoken and about so often. And seasons as well. I remember sitting at my desk in an office looking at the tree outside the window going, I have no idea what time of year it is. Mm. I have no idea what the weather is like outside. And then yeah. suddenly to be in a garden where you feel yeah. every day the season and the next season that's coming and what's emerging and, yeah. you know, the little peas behind you that are popping up and the daffodils mm. that are appearing and you notice every new leaf emergent. You, you know, do. I'm watching yeah. that rhubarb grow every day yeah, really <laughs> at the moment. I love you know, that. You, it's, it's addictive because you want to come back the next day and see that of rhubarb. Course. You want to come the next day Day, and then the next day and the next day and then you want to harvest it and then you want to cook it and then it clicked with my obsession with food and eating mm -hmm. and then it became a bigger thing and then mixed in with that I ended up going to India to um, anybody who knows about Vandana Shiva who's a, a, a climate and um, environmental activist and specifically around women's issues okay 
and uh, got kind of was like fascinated by the idea that uh, gardening and food growing could be linked to uh, feminism and women's issues. And so I ended up going and staying on her farm for a few months and having this kind of big opening up and realisation about the links between food and diet mm-hmm. food and health food and climate change food and yeah. you know and then was very privileged to be able to take that time to really learn and really understand and really is that uh, where you learned your passion. horticultural practices then where did i'd you say that was more where the po- politics came okay. uh-huh. and then from there um decided okay this is what i want to do i want to be a a, a woman who mm-hmm. who grows food and uh, I, so then from there, I spent a year with um, an amazing um, uh, mar- mar- gardener farmer called Jane Scotter, who in um, Herefordshire, a farm called Fernbarrow. And that's where I really kind of dug my heels in with a 60 hour working week okay. uh-huh. and um, learned how to grow vegetables uh-huh. and not just grow them, but really grow them for kind of to a refined exquisite exquisite mm-hmm. kind of standard yeah, of flavor yeah. and color and taste and 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 amongst a part of all of this is you know obviously everything here is organic so where did that come into your so training and i learning? mean officially we're not organic okay um we're not certified um to say you're organic as a food producer you need to go through a certification process quite rightly um you know if you're going to use a logo and sell a product and say that it is organic you have to go through that process we can't afford that process as a small scale Mm -hmm. grow it's very expensive and um it has made the kind of organic certification thing kind of a little bit exclusive I'm very passionate about organic techniques and what organic is. What I have learned from being back in Norfolk is not many people are interested in that. And I have had this privileged period in my life to really understand why organic is important. But to most people, it's a thing that is marketed to them as a luxury that they can't afford. Really? And I think it's really important to acknowledge that, that it's off-putting. Organic can be off-putting to people. And actually, I think the conversation we need to be having more is... Um, that we can't afford to not work in ecological ways anymore. Yeah, we can't, we can't afford to damage our soils any further. Um, you know. But it's getting that word out there. It's educating people, isn't it? And that's so hard to do, to spread the word. Well, it is. And, you know, most people are gardeners and they've gardened for... You know, a lot of people have gardened for many years. They have their techniques and they work for them. Mm. And they don't really, they don't really want to change them. There's no reason to change them. And what's really interesting for us is that most of the people who come here to experience and to learn and and to try something different, most of them are kind of under the age of 35. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them don't have gardens. A lot of them are in the housing crisis of, you know, rented flats and if they've got a few pots there. They're lucky, and yet they still have that real longing for a garden or a bit of land to call their own. And um, and so we're kind of working with with a kind of younger, more people who are at the beginning of their gardening journeys, right, okay. mm-hmm. or people who want to step up their 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 gardening skills to be more productive. And so, in a way, the way we teach here is. Is this is this is just normal gardening? Do you think the younger generation are more interested in being? Uh, they're more conscious about the you know climate change and the planet and, and yeah, sustainability and definitely. That, yeah. And you know, and we we use you know organic seeds and organic compost, and we make a lot of our own compost, and we use organic pest management, and <coughs> and um, we use a lot of no dig gardening techniques to build the soil biology. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, not a lot of this is very different from how our grandparents and great-grandparents were gardening, yeah. you know, 50, yeah. 80 years yes, ago. Absolutely. I mean, it's only really in the last 50 mm. years that that things mm-hmm. have, have changed. I'm not saying there isn't room to develop and move techniques forward. There definitely is, and we need, we need to be much savvier yeah. in the future. I'm not saying we need to go mm. backwards. But I, in a way, sometimes the organic thing confuses people because a lot of the gardening techniques like making compost well if you're a gardener you you make compost you make compost mm. yeah um yeah quite 
I learned all any all of my organic gardening practices from my uncle when mm. I was tiny. He yeah. he was yeah, always organic same. gardener. Yeah. He never yeah. used any pesticides, herbicides, mm. nothing. He was all you know. That's I mean, how if it you was. if you make compost, you don't need um, any chemical based plant food. Mm. You are then building a soil. You you know in a biological ecological way and increasing diversity beyond the soil yeah. because obviously it has a knock-on impact for birds and insects. Yeah. Mm. And if you are growing a lot of different things and you enjoy and you love gardening and you're celebrating kind of the diversity of crops and that you can grow, then pest management is really, and weed management is not, mm-hmm. it's not a big deal to not use yeah. chemicals or yeah. pesticides or herbicides. Yeah. I, well, I agree. I think yeah, we should um, find out a little bit more in the second part of the podcast about um, techniques people can use in their own gardens. And Absolutely, and try and grow the best flavoured veg, but in the easiest way as well. Yeah, mm. and cheapest too. Yeah. So it's really inspiring um, to see what Hannah has created at Eve's Hill, isn't it? Mm, like from nothing, from sure. just, a, just a field to an organic market farm. Yeah, and I hadn't quite realised before the importance of having to improve the soil because, of course, yeah. over the years the soil gets depleted. And I think back to when my, my dad was growing vegetables, it's like he was never having this, that you know, impressive harvest or anything. So <laughs> I, I know that he wasn't necessarily improving the soil. So that kind of... Yeah. Seems to make sense because, of course, it does tire over the years. But that's with any kind of growing, isn't it? Mm. We all want lovely, beautiful flowers and fruits and vegetables, but without the soil and knowing what you're planting in the, in the correct soil, mm. you, you won't reap the reward, will you? So, mm, for sure, yeah. You know, Hannah learned from that failure, so she started to sow as soon as she took over that land yeah, and nothing yeah. grew, and so she realised that then, of course, she needed to... Um, really work the soil and feed it mm. and now implements the no dig approach yeah definitely and it's it's weird to talk to her and kind of say oh well i feel like organic is the new normal but of course yeah. she's like well organic has always been the normal yeah but, but we're so conditioned to using chemicals that yeah. yeah it's weird that we then are going back to an organic way which is actually the normal it kind way. of should be do you know what i mean so. i can't i've i don't use chemicals i am an organic gardener and mm. That's not without its difficulties, for sure. But I can't, personally, I don't understand why anybody would want to use chemicals in the garden, mm. or especially especially around edible mm. food. Um, you I know. guess it's that quick fix attitude, though, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it's, um, somebody did actually say that's the lazy fix, because, mm. yes, it might be the quick fix, but part of gardening is getting down and dirty, if you like. So weeding and, you know, it's hard work sometimes, but actually you reap the rewards again of, like, Mm. getting involved. And I've had bindweed problems on my old allotment for years. drove me crazy and I could have easily, not easily, but I could have used a chemical approach, but I didn't. I just kept on Mm. weeding. And you have to get your head around that as an organic gardener, I think. Yeah, that it can be hard work It can be hard work, but Mm. I would rather that than use something that's detrimental to the environment, to people, and, of course, Mm. to um, wildlife, bees. Mm -hmm. Well, to your own health. It seems really stupid to to use a chemical that could be harming you yourself. Yeah, and Hannah at, at the farm has shown just what can be produced from organic gardening. Mm. And you can see that it works, and she's helping yeah. others to find out about it as well. Absolutely. Very passionate. OK, in part two, we're going to look at what you can grow at home and how you can grow organically. And more importantly, we're going to open up the big question of the difference between growing in an organic and non-organic way and how that can affect not just the crops but the way you feel about the crops that you're growing too so that's going to open that up with you now Hannah the differences between organic and non-organic so for me the non-organic bit is the thing that's different Mm. and that's the bit where you have to go to a shop and spend money and buy an input Mm -hmm. that costs you money and that you have to 
add to your growing so a pesticide or a herbicide and obviously that's the thing that's going to have a negative impact on the biodiversity of your soil and of the wildlife the insects the, the you know the bees the so we're almost switching you. up here what is so, normal what is yeah. defined as normal i'm now, trying to say that yeah. what's normal is to not use those things and yeah. not spend your money mm-hmm. on things that actually you're being sold as something that's going to help you mm-hmm. in the short term it's going to kill your weeds or it's going to feed your plants or it's going to kill not just the insect you're trying to kill but actually all the insects in your mm-hmm. garden and i'm saying that those are the things that are, are not normal yep. okay. and so if you take them away what mm-hmm. you're left with is is normal is normal garden that yeah. makes total yeah. sense yeah, yeah. doesn't it um, it makes sense but people do not see it that way do they? No. and it's you know no. why spend your money on a, a a plant food when you can put your kitchen waste in a compost heap mm-hmm. and make beautiful compost and you know gardeners gardeners know about compost i mean yeah. that's that's yeah. just that's normal stuff yeah. and gardeners know the more compost you put mm-hmm. on the soil the more worms you see and the more insects you mm-hmm. have and um you know we know that when we see an owl we cheer because they're eating our mice mm-hmm. we have the lovely barn owl that's just appeared here in the last oh, week wow. which is really exciting <laughs> <laughs> and we have a whole problem so hooray for the barn owls yeah. we know we know a you know anybody who spends time in the garden they they know about these things uh-huh. this Absolutely. is not these are not new ideas yeah. but how about how do we stop you know the quick fix of just using a pesticide on our plants what um, what are the other options and are they such a quick fix i mean they're not really a quick f- mm. fix because then they're so indiscriminate uh-huh. you know they won't just kill the insect that you're trying to kill they will kill everything uh-huh. like humans so people well. need to bear yeah. this in mind so humans yeah. do yeah. it's not just the things um, around it it's, you, you and know. you know and so it's so you know you want to kill an aphid but you're actually going to end up killing the mm-hmm. ladybirds that are feeding on the aphids and you're going to end up killing whatever was feeding on mm. the ladybirds um, so and it ends up being really stupid, yeah. isn't it? To be and, honest. and and that's yeah. not even going into the kind of research and no. data around the impact of pesticides on us and the links to cancers and mm-hmm. infertility problems and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And they'll, you know, go and find a website for Pesticide mm-hmm. Watch and mm-hmm. and look look up that data. Is there is there a difference with crops growing organically and non-organically do you see a difference in um how much you can harvest so there's a brilliant thing like i actually really you know i don't want to sound antagonistic to people who choose to use (coughs) chemicals and and pesticides and particularly within the farming community you know they have been farming in an economy that has they they have to compete with their neighbors and other farmers and and a farming industry that has an expectation that this is how you farm and these are people's livelihoods so we are renting land on a, on a non-organic farm and I'm really fascinated by that and I'm fascinated by the dialogue of how do all farmers and all gardeners m- move away from reliance on, on chemicals on pesticides and herbicides um baby brain forgotten your question oh because gloria uh, the gloria remember everyone there's a baby here hannah has just had a, a baby. very quiet baby a very quiet baby but hannah is allowed to have baby brain I, is there a difference in the harvest from organic and okay. non-organic gardening? brilliant thank you so when we first started growing here and we took over um land that had been farmed non-organically for about 50 years yeah and the first year i was like we'll just put a load of compost in and then we'll plant up the crops and then they'll grow. I just thought that's what would happen. Mm-hmm. And Robert, the farmer, a really wonderful, experienced farmer, kept driving past his truck looking at me going, they're not growing, Hannah. Your crops are not growing. <laughs> I got... shouldn't be laughing. And then he was like, I've got some fertiliser in the shed and would you, you know, if I were you, I'd get some on there quick because you're going to lose them you know sage advice from a very experienced farmer who's dependent (laughs) dependent on his crops for his livelihoods and what was really interesting is i'd been teaching organic horticulture for like three or four years and i suddenly realized i had to dig a bit deeper to understand why these crops weren't growing and what i very quickly realized is that because this soil hadn't been grown using compost using organic matter for 50 Mm -hmm. years it things had been taken 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 out of the soil but nothing had been returned that what had happened is that the soil biology had basically died and if you have dead soil which is just basically a growing medium and then you're 
growing plants with the kind of steroids of, of, of nutrients that you apply, plants won't grow in the same way without those steroids. And so we basically had to backtrack and reintroduce soil biology into the soil. And that's where I got really obsessed by if anybody is interested in this, Dr. Elaine Ingham, who is an amazing soil biologist in America, who will teach you how to make compost teas and reapply the kind of soil organisms to the soil that plants need to be able to have the uptake of nutrients that then enable them to grow. Fascinating. So we had to basically start again from scratch on this soil, which made me really interested in the idea that, yes, I mean, growing organically is different if you're starting on soil that is basically close to... Um, sterile in terms of soil biology yeah. most gardeners and allotment growers are inheriting soil that's probably had a lot of compost added to yeah, it and it's very alive lot, and therefore yeah. the kind of growing organic or non-organic is if you took away those plant foods and those mm-hmm. things is it, there's very little difference so really. uh, so your crops are now in abundance aren't they absolutely yeah. and you um <laughs> you use the no dig method here is that right we do for about half of the site there's a certain scale beyond which no dig becomes quite difficult and your yeah. barrowing gets quite hard and, and no dig being you just put the compost on top of the soil and let the sort of biology work it into the soil for you yeah um and so, yeah, we used it on about half, about half the site. And what are and you growing? What are you growing here? So uh, the core of our kind of social enterprise business model is um, a mixed leaf cut and come again salad. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got two polytunnels where we grow tomatoes and cucumbers. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a small area where we grow fast growing crops in succession. Um, so either in succession with themselves or each other. So we try and get three crops a year in each of those beds. And then we have what we call our field area, which has kind of got standing crops like um, kale and, and beetroot and celeriac and crops that we can just pick wow. when we need it's them. It's like a huge allotment. <laughs> But it is, and, it's, huge and it is still a garden. I mean, yeah. this is one of the things for me that's really important is I'm a gardener and I love gardening and I mm-hmm. work with my hands and I work with hand tools and what we teach here is gardening. Yeah. Um, and these are s- techniques and skills that people can use at home and in their garden or allotment or even in a pot. And yet we're kind of scaling it up so that it's very highly productive in a quite a small, mm. we're in quite a small area. And everything's grown to order as well, isn't it? So you're zero waste, you're telling We waste. We harvest yeah. to order. Mm-hmm. So we don't harvest okay. anything until it's already sold. Uh, harv- ah, harvest so, to order. Yeah, which Not is really order. important okay. in the kind mm-hmm. of mod- modern food system. And, um, you know, I think the statistic is that in um, farm-scale horticulture, 50% of produce is wasted by the time it gets onto people's mm-hmm. plates, whether that's because they're wonky <laughs> vegetables or they don't get sold, they sit on the supermarket sh- shelf and end up in the bin or end up in somebody's fridge and not get used Mm -hmm. so what we try and do is have a system where we pre-sell everything and then harvest it so we you know i love i love the culture of market stalls but we don't do market stalls because you would come home not knowing Mm. you know Mm -hmm. what you're going to sell and for people at home that are growing their own fruit and vegetables are there some things that are better suited to organic growing you know perhaps easier vegetables to start with what what would you recommend i don't think that's any different from non-organic growing okay I don't think there's any... I can't see that there would make any mm-hmm. any difference whatsoever. I think if you are... You know, the main difference as, as an organic gardener would be just caring for the soil. Mm-hmm. So making So that compost, is really the key to everything you can... What we're saying is you can grow anything you, you want to... anything you want. ...as long as you're improving the soil As long as you're first. constantly improving yeah. the soil. Because a lot of people soil. out there probably think, oh, that looks too difficult to grow, I'd have to, you But know, that would be the same whether you're yeah. organic or non-organic. You know, mm. there are easy things to grow, like courgettes and runner beans and beetroot mm-hmm. and chard. Okay. Um, and then there are things that are slightly more tricky to grow, mm-hmm. um, like you know where you have to understand a little bit more about timings and temperatures and germination rates mm-hmm. and um that you kind of you grow after you've been growing for a few years mm-hmm. yeah. so, okay. but i don't think that's i don't mm-hmm. think that's linked to whether you're organic or not mm-hmm. so do you have any specific organic gardening tips for people at home like how can they get rid of pests and diseases that kind of thing if they're growing organic I mean, should i just give examples of what we do here yeah that'd be is perfect. that the easiest way to yeah, do that that'd be perfect um so for example with brassica crops so our cabbages our kales we cover them with a very fine um, mesh called enviromesh yeah. which you can get in garden centers it's they call it insect netting mm-hmm. and that's just to stop flea beetle and um cabbage white 
butterflies. Those lovely cabbage Those white lovely butterflies. Those lovely butterflies from laying their caterpillar <laughs> eggs. And that's sufficient enough to protect the brassica crops from problems. We have bird, hare and partridge problem here. And so for crops that are susceptible to them, so lettuces and some of the chards and beetroots, we, use just, we just do use a netting. Mm-hmm. We, in terms of uh, the kind of aphidy kind of problems, one of the, or, or like thunderflies, mm-hmm. thrips, we've had thrips, thrips mm-hmm. here. One of the things that we have kind of passionately believe in is to grow a lot of open flower heads, so kind of your marigolds and your cosmo, cosmos, and just fill the garden with a lot of flowers. So at the end of every bed, mm-hmm. we will plant. You're thinking about your companion planting. Yeah, companion yeah. planting, but for beneficial insects. Yeah. And we've seen really positive results when we've had pest problems of bringing in the hoverflies mm. and, and the beneficial insects to deal with those. What plants do you use? What flowers do Any you use? flower that's got a very open head that, in, that a hoverfly can land on. Mm-hmm. So My, a lot, mar- usually marigolds. there's lots of marigolds. Marigolds yeah, are really great. Marigolds, yeah. and, and, and the kind of calendula star marigolds particularly. Yeah. And yeah. Mm-hmm. cosmos. Yeah. Um, they look pretty too. They okay, look pretty yeah. and they're bright. And even in polytunnels, you know, the insects will find their way in. So we interplant our tomatoes yeah. with mm-hmm. with marigolds for that reason because we have thrips problem. Okay. One um, and I've always grown uh, spring onions amongst my carrots because apparently that deters uh, carrot root fly. Apparently, does it work? Yeah. I've never had carrot root fly. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, the other thing is just... I daren't not try it in case I get it. I mean, there's so many tips around carrots. And, you know, I think all allotment growers have those kind of conversations about, you know, whatever whatever techniques they use about, oh, you only, you know, don't weed them at this time of day and... Mm -hmm. Um, if it works for you, then yeah. it's like and that's, very that's, that's, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what's great about gardening is you every year you try something else, don't you? And every yeah. year you ask uh, ask another gardener for another tip. And, yeah. and every year you get excited by, I'm going to try and do it like that this year yeah. and see what happens. And yeah. some people will have great success with carrots and some people will have terrible success with them. Yeah. That's just the fun of it. It and, is, that's and gardening. I, and yeah. I think, you know, one of the great things about market gardening is you, you know, we grow about 30 different kinds of salad leaves and we've probably got... 40 or 50 different kinds of vegetables let alone how many different cultivars and so maybe one thing will you know mm. get caught out by that awful drought we had last year and another thing will do really really well and yeah. maybe one thing will get caught yeah. out by by aphids but another thing will do really really well yeah. and you part I think one of the joys of gardening is that nature is a little bit bigger than us isn't it just well, a bit it's also variable though people are often put off if something doesn't grow but they forget that plants are a living thing yeah, yeah it's, quite. it's not going yeah, befo- yeah. to perform the same not for just everyone plants, but the weather and the conditions yeah, exactly, and every, yeah. every year is different but that's where a lot of people see that as their own failure which is yeah. something that yeah. we're actively trying to convince people Absolutely. it's not your fault there are so many different that, things. no that's really lovely yeah. i remember when i first started volunteering at a market garden mm. and they got me to do seed sowing and i couldn't believe that that would actually grow because of, I thought <laughs> I had that impact on that plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it, me yeah, sowing, that makes being so the person sense. sowing it, yeah. would have a negative impact on it. <laughs> and then they grew, and very quickly. And and that lovely grower, a lovely guy called Jeremy down in Devon, was like, mm-hmm. Hannah, you've got to learn. You put a seed in the ground and it grows. There's <laughs> nothing you can do about it. And it's not about your skill and it's not necessarily. About you. yeah. And that's so much the case. Like we are there trying to control the. The, the climate and the conditions and the mm-hmm. and you know yeah. and that's that's the interference is the gardening bit but it's also the other thing mm-hmm. we touched on um before we were on mic earlier we were talking about horticultural methods and practices and yeah. the advice that some of the experts can give it's there's not one type of advice that no. works it could be a no. range of different advice but sometimes in horticulture it's always seen as no. unless you're doing it that way you're going to fail but again it's variable and so it's people so, panic I think yeah. as well so the beginners important. panic there is that. there is no one way to do anything mm. every garden you visit but everyone it's great will have if their we can own technique that yes. and celebrate that sometimes yeah. yeah and also be excited by it because mm. we get to constantly be excited by what other people yeah, do yeah, yeah. and how they do it. Although frequently down the allotment, not my new allotment because that's ace, but where I'm trying I was, to be smart where, where I, yeah, I'm trying to be smart. No, I'm not. Um, some people would come over to me and say, "You don't want to do it like that. You mm. want to do it like this." And I think, oh, you know, just 
no, just let me mm, have a go. That, <laughs> you know. If you wind back to what are we on episode one where we talked about garden snobbery, yeah, yeah, and it's all it, part yeah, of that. Yeah, and it's like no, it? I think I yeah. think this is going to work, and it works. And mm. you know, I can remember when I very first took my allotment on. Yeah. Um, I was uh, the youngest, and I was female in an allotment that was mostly um, older men, and that's a mm. fact. And um, I was kind of not accepted I suppose and what my methods were different and mm. uh, there were some odd looks my <laughs> way when I first you know took took it over and then I can remember at the end of my first season I was backing onto a field and somebody another allotment um, owner was walking down the field round the back and he looked over at me and he went, it seems you've done very well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget it. And it was almost your gritted teeth, but he did say uh-huh. it, which is really nice. And and I do do things perhaps a bit differently to someone my lot. But different but doesn't mean wrong. Different isn't wrong. No. Um, it was just different to perhaps what a certain generation has has always done. Mm. Um, there's new research, there's new techniques, there's new ways of doing things, there's different you varieties. You might find a new technique yourself. Different cultivars. Well. Yeah, you yeah, might yeah. find that, and that's the key. You mm. might find a way that works for you. And, and, and so, so why not do yeah, it that and, way? And media is changing, you know. Mm. I, I, I love a good book and I've got my Joy Larkham and she's my guru for yeah. my techniques and what mm-hmm. I do and how I do it. But I'm also watching YouTube videos and I'm also Mm. on wonderful Facebook groups for UK market gardeners and everybody's like asking each other, well, how do you do this? And what's the what's the best way of this? And the sharing of knowledge Mm. is 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 changing and the supporting each other and the farm tours and the garden walks and the Mm -hmm. you know, I mean Yeah. Yeah, well that's amazing. I think um where can uh, listeners find you online um so yeah we've got a website which is eveshillvegco.com and um, we've got a lovely facebook page which often has lots of photos of our what we're doing and what's going on here um and then they can join us on a wednesday here at the farm which is um north of norwich um the last saturday of every month we have an open day and people are welcome to come and have a look around and see what we do get involved find out how to get involved come mm-hmm. and see us really yeah um and then we're also helping um a community center in reefham called the butcham center to establish a centenary garden at the moment so we're there on mondays as well mm-hmm. so and what's interesting about that is that's more kind of ornamental gardening so mm-hmm. for anybody who's more interested in that side of gardening and is a bit like oh I'd like to have a go and I I, you know I'd like a little bit of help or I'd like to get some practical Mm -hmm. learning that would be a great place to show up so there's loads of ways to connect she's so busy and she's got a baby too how do you do all of that we thought we were busy Gloria has stayed quiet (laughs) the whole time she slept the whole time isn't that amazing and I also noticed that as soon as we've come to the end of this podcast it's got really quiet outside as well so throughout the podcast it's been raining on the polytunnel obviously I think she's got some lavender planted near the baby maybe so must be the case she just really likes sleeping in the polytunnel. I don't know what it is, but Wonderful. I might even have to wake her up because she's been sleeping a bit long. Yeah, let's go wake her up. Thank you so much, Hannah. Pleasure. It's been really interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm just um, going to slurp my chai latte now. In the same way that you slurp coffee. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> so I couldn't even do it. <laughs> do you know? You've got the knack of it. I've told you guys before. <laughs> since since I've been spending a lot of time in China and like Japan, they do slurp <laughs> their drinks and their ramen, their soups. And so when I have a hot drink here in the UK, I'm often slurping it. And I forget who's around me. I did it to you that time as well, didn't I? <laughs> I thought it was brilliant, though. I can't even oh. do it when I try. Mm. Anyway, let's talk about vegetables. Yes, I can slurp vegetable soup. You can slurp, <laughs> depending where you are. Yes, you can. Vegetables? What do you want to say about you vegetables? You can't really be Ellen making Mary. your own vegetable soup from veg grown on your allotment, you know? You can't? No, you can't beat it. It's the oh, best. can't beat it, right. just, It's just the best. I've never done it, but I've made my own soup from nettles. Okay, part. nettle soup. Yeah, it's pretty nice. I've never had nettle soup. Have what is not? it like? It's mostly potato and a few nettles. <laughs> No, it's really nice, honestly. <laughs> it's really, really good for you as well. So, okay. Yeah. So, uh, what, are you, what kind of 
vegetable, but at the moment, obviously, I've what started. What kind of vegetable this, are you? What, yeah, if you could describe yourself as a which vegetable would you be? Oh my god, this is great. Yes, I hadn't thought about that. I've got a friend who did a, a course, a business. Hang on, bear with me. I am. Who did a workshop, and they had to take the vegetable or fruit that most described their management style. And so he spoke to us the weekend before and was like, what should I take? I'm really confused. And then I worked out he should take a peach. Okay. Because he's hard on the inside, but he's got this soft, squidgy outside. So he's kind of seems like he's friendly, but he's still kind of strict in the middle. So bearing this in mind, what what vegetable are we? Vegetable or fruit? Um, Oh, this is difficult. mm. Um... I think... Am I going to say what I think you are? Or, or are oh, I don't you know. That might be pick? too awkward. I don't think... I think you're a Jerusalem be. artichoke. Oh, wow. You're all knobbly and it makes you fart. <laughs> <laughs> I've just laughed into your knee. <laughs> well, no, you have to choose for yourself. Otherwise, we're just going to be too nasty to each other. I... Choose your own vegetable. I think... I would be. Um, oh, I can't think. I um, I would probably be a um, carrot. Boring. But what colour? Orange one or a red nice... one? Oh, a cool one. Or a purple one or a white one, but not an orange one. Why a carrot then? Because like I'm a... well, I don't know. That's just the one I picked. <laughs> Is that because you got this really flamboyant? Um, kind of exterior on the top of the soil but beneath the soil you go down pretty deep and a lot of that is kind of like you know, I don't know. hard and structured I don't, and know, if, of, yeah? I don't know if I do go down deep really <laughs> I, I'm, I'm one of those stunted carrots that yeah. comes out all wonky <laughs> <laughs> what's that called parmex the variety that's me oh what okay what oh, vegetable would I be <laughs> um oh I don't know. <laughs> um, I think that you would be a Romanesco. Oh, yeah. What do you think for Oh, that? all a bit exotic and alien-like. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But tasty and nutritious. And a little bit jaundiced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, anyway. What, what veg are you growing on your allotment this season? Because this is National Garden Week episode, yes. so... You know, let's give give us some uh, inspiration. Give us some veg inspiration. So this melon, <laughs> melon. Well, that's that's obviously Michael's nickname for me. If you didn't mm-hmm. know that already, you do now. <laughs> um, mine for him is peanut. <laughs> so uh, this, I, as the allotment that I've now got is much smaller than my mm-hmm. other allotment, so I've had to be really. It looks big I've on pictures, to, though. It's half. Is that Photoshop? It's half an allotment. <laughs> no, there's no Photoshop going on. Believe me, I don't actually know uh-huh. how you use Photoshop. Um, Whatever. It's, I don't, I really don't. I've never used Photoshop. Yeah. I might be in the past life. Um, I've had to plan meticulously, and it's no dig this year as well, uh-huh. so in order to attempt to save myself some time. Mm-hmm. So I'm growing lots of vegetables, but only a small amount of each. Okay. And I've thought really long and hard That's about... That's wise, though. Yeah, really? I think so, because yeah. actually, whilst it's very nice if you get lots of veg and you get a glut and you can give it to friends or family mm. or even the local food but gluts bank, can be so irritating. I, I, they can be, and yeah. actually it's only myself and my husband who I actually really need to feed, mm. you know, and so... So I'm doing sort of one row, if you like, of almost every vegetable that um, I'm growing. So I've got a big salad bed, all kinds of different salads, but I really Mm -hmm. love colourful stuff. Mm. So I will pick beetroots and radishes and carrots that are all different colours. And then I've got um, cauliflower sprouts. Isn't that a really long season? It's a long season, but it's so satisfying. Um, kale, because I love kale. Mm-hmm. Eat lots and lots of kale. So That's lots cool. of brassicas. Uh-huh. Um, oh, I've got... Can I just talk about cauliflower for a minute? Yeah. In Asia, they sell one which is almost like tender stem broccoli, but okay. cauliflower version. Okay. So it's very kind of stringy, and it's right. really cool. You use it in stir fries. It's amazing. I wish. Very nice. I wish that was on sale here. Yeah. Um, and I'm 
I am growing some runner beans, but I don't know why, because I don't actually like them that much. And you always get squillions of them when you don't need. So I've only, I've only got four runner bean plants and they're actually mm-hmm. growing in a raised bed with other stuff. So I'm, I'm quite, everything's kind of compacted in mm-hmm. a lot. Um, I have got carrots and parsnips, all of those kind of things as well. My green parsnips, that's another one that I, like I haven't grown vegetables much since I was a teenager, but parsnips are a to grow, aren't they? If you've got so it's long I season think, again. It's a it? long season, yeah. but they last really well in the ground if you don't yeah, harvest them, okay. you know, straight away. And if you've got a nice soil, um, mm. slightly sandy soil like we have done okay. our allotment, they grow into quite You're lucky nice, then, aren't you? Yeah. Lucky, not so lucky, depending on what way you want to look at it. Hot, dry weather with the sandy soil is a nightmare. Mm-hmm. But it does mean that you can grow root crops quite okay. well. Yeah, yeah. Um I've got celeriac growing. No way. Yeah, wow, celeriac that's so cool. Is, Ace turnips. If How you... do you use it, may I ask? Uh, if it's not too personal, the question. You know, like a coleslaw. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, you love yeah. it like that, kind That's of cool. mixed I in love celeria. with other things like cabbages, stuff mm. like just all chopped up. It's really so cool. yummy. So very raw. I bought some from the Polish shop two yeah, days ago. Right. Uh, not pickled, but just in brine. Yeah. It's delicious. The, fl- the flavour is yeah, 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 fantastic. Yeah. I've got a but big herb. We don't eat it much in UK. Do we? we don't. Yeah. I think it's become a bit more popular now at mm. uh, certain restaurants do use it more yeah, for sure yeah. but you can use it in soups and salads and all kinds of things it has a lovely flavour and it's good. so good for you and mm-hmm. um, I'm trying to grow celery I've never had much success with celery but I'm giving it a go because I try and I have a celery uh-huh. juice every morning because it's good for your digestion oh, it tastes horrible though. it's not the best no oh, but it's oh. super good for digestion but celery you have to earth it up right you do yeah, so, yeah. you um, do all of that um, yes Okay. Yeah, I'd be doing all of that. Um, the greenhouse is full. It'll be, it's <coughs> tomatoes, cucumbers, all of mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Chilies, well, what aubergines. Which tomatoes? Um, sun gold. Sun, I am actually growing sun oh, gold. Delicious. I am well documented as hating tomatoes, but sun gold I will eat happily fresh from the plant because they're so sweet and yeah, delicious. Yeah, the flavour oh, is just totally superb, isn't well, it? Your, oh, well, this, I've pad. got like oh, a list you. of everything that I'm growing. So and then I am very square, but it's because it's so small, I've got yeah. to be so organised, more organised oh, than usual. Look, tomato sun gold. Mm-hmm. Um, what else have I got? Oh, courgettes, obviously, because we all mm-hmm. have to have some courgettes. I'm also doing uh, buffalo steak tomatoes. Oh, cool. But I'm not growing them for red tomatoes. I'm growing them for green tomatoes. Oh, for a green tomato chutney? Fried green tomatoes. Really? But isn't that a byproduct rather than an intention? <laughs> no, I'm going to harvest them before they've ripened, uh-huh. and then I'm going to have them for fried green tomatoes because my husband loves fried, fried green tomatoes. So what? It's just fried green tomato. Yeah. But it's with spices or what is it? Yeah, you got spices or, yeah, you can do whatever you want with it. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's amazing. It's fabulous. So I'm only growing them for that purpose. Well, in what area does that sort of practice originate then? Oh, it's, it's the very, film, it's Southern fried America. Fried green tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even know what it's about, yeah. but yeah. Southern America. Aha. Uh-huh. So, and we were in, um... We were in Charlotte last year, mm. North Carolina, and fried green tomatoes were everywhere. Oh, God, on I really want to try them. Well, there Where you go. Where can I get you... green tomatoes at this here, time of year? Though? Here in the summer. <laughs> yeah, but, like, imagine going to the shop and asking for green tomatoes. <laughs> yeah, they were, everyone They'd be would be like, like what, what the hell? You moan that they're not ripe enough, and now you want yeah, green ones. <laughs> I know. Anyway, and onions, and what else will there be? All right. I see a sneaky sunflower. Sunflower? Where's the, the sunflower? Bottom. Oh, Somebody yeah, that's a potted sunflower. Hey, hey. That's actually for my garden. That's a cool sunflower as well. There you go. But anyway, there's lots <coughs> in a very small space. Oh, that's beautiful. Sweet corn as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to grow sweet corn. Yeah. I don't know if I ever got the best crops off it though. Um, I have. I've grown. Mm-hmm. I've only grown sweet corn twice. First year, a brilliant, amazing, mm-hmm. tasty, perfect. Second year, not so good. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. But we're, I'm giving those a go as well. I think, to be honest, and uh, it'd be great if you can pull this off, because I think when I used to grow veg, I used to try and do too many things. Yeah. And there were too many things that needed different care yeah. in one space. And so it was then yeah. a nightmare. And uh, yeah, and I just remember it all becoming quite overgrown. Yeah, and, I think it will be uh, an interesting season, mm, definitely. But also, I mean, I've never worked on allotment, but when I had my house in Suffolk, I used to have a vegetable garden at the bottom of the garden. But having something at the bottom of the gun. You're not necessarily going down there every day and giving it the care it should. Mm. How do you cope with an allotment? How do you know, like, you must have to be quite disciplined getting to the allotment. I, lots of people say to me, I when I 
go there, oh, your allotment looks really neat and tidy. Mm. You must be here every day. I don't have time to be there every mm. day. But your layout is tidy. You've got nice I, raised beds, the, the pathways. Most, yeah, the yeah. most important part, I think, of an allotment is planning it out in the first place. Mm-hmm. And almost like the hard landscaping. Having your paths ready, having your beds ready, and um, being able to um, rotate your planting. Okay. And having that structure then gives you the opportunity to care for it easier. So when I go to the allotment, I am on a mission I have a list I have my priorities and I try and it's not always possible I try not to get distracted because once you've done one job there's always a million others but I'm really strict with what I do when I go there and because I might only have two hours on a Monday and one hour on a Saturday you know I don't know if I can be down there longer then I will of course but sometimes I can't go for a whole week yeah what about Um, watering in summer uh, is that not a recipe for disaster watering has has to happen (laughs) yeah I've actually never really had a problem with it. Lots of mulch, Mm, using straw. Um, I use plant grow as well, so I have a really Mm -hmm. thick layer of mulch around all my plants, which helps to retain the water, especially Mm -hmm. in sandy soil, because obviously it just dries out so quickly. Um, But like I said, this year will be a real test, I think, Mm. of that. But it's prioritising and planning and just doing little and often. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, little and often is better. Well, how impressive. <laughs> well, we don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you've had a lot of this in the past, haven't you? Right? Yeah, little and often. Yeah. And sometimes it can get overwhelming. There's certain periods in the year, which is definitely spring, mm-hmm. late spring, when all your seedlings are going crazy and you don't know what mm-hmm. you're doing and like there's seed trees And of course everywhere. we often talk about how um, competitive that can be online oh, as well. Gosh, like when I was yeah. growing seedlings when I was a kid, there was I, I didn't know what anybody else was growing. Like maybe my yeah. grandma was growing it, no. but we weren't competing. No. So. You were focused on what you <laughs> yeah. were growing and yeah. Yeah, so these days there's those added pressures to, yeah. to all areas of life, really. Yeah, yeah. there is. And I think don't pre- don't be pressured. Mm. You know what? If you forget... Well, just don't show if, anyone else if you you haven't so, If you haven't sowed something or you've forgotten to sow something or those seeds have, haven't worked so well, don't worry about it. The world mm. is not going to end. Exactly. Concentrate on all the other stuff that you've got to grow yeah. you know and don't don't worry about it just enjoy what you're doing and it's really sad when you don't get the success of mm. something that you're growing and I know that it's really disappointing but don't worry about it just focus on the stuff that's growing really really well definitely you know wow. and just enjoy it Oh, so nice to have a bit of a veg chat with you. It is, isn't it? Yeah. You uh, Romanesco, you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not growing any more of you, so they're not coming down. This year. <laughs> I literally have no comeback. <laughs> <laughs> The Plant Based Podcast is sponsored by Sutton's, suppliers of gardeners' favourite products since 1806. Unsurprisingly, Sutton's now have everything you need for your outside space. Award-winning flower and vegetable plants, garden furniture and equipment, plus gifts for gardeners. Visit them online at suttons.co.uk. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Plant Based Podcast. Have a browse of the rest of the library or hop on over to the website, which is theplantbasedpodcast.net. You'll also find our social media links. Please connect with us and let us know about any plant-based projects that you think we should be covering on the show. And make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you'll be the first to hear the next episode. We're releasing once a fortnight. So until next time, enjoy the world of plants.